Welcome everybody to today's uh, combustion webinar. It's the second webinar for this semester series. And today we're hosting uh, Santosh Himchandra, who's an associate professor at the Department of Aerospace Engineering in the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. His research group focuses primarily on the dynamics of reflect reacting flows in uh, gas turbines, rocket applications, using a wide range of techniques from uh, stability analysis to LES. And today he's going to be talking about uh, the hydrodynamic instabilities in gas turbine combustor flows and their passive control. So before we get started, I'll just um, run you through. We want you to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes to leave maybe 10 to 15 minutes for a question and answer at the end of the webinar. And uh, anybody in the audience who wants to ask a question, just please put it in the chat window at the bottom and we'll read them out um, as many as we can at the end as time allows and uh, give Professor Anjandra a chance to answer them individually one by one. So so with that, the floor is yours and um, take it away. Thanks very much, Isaac. And uh, my thanks to the organizers for uh, having me give this uh, webinar. Uh, so th this uh, is essentially sort of a, com a collection of work that we've been doing uh, on this topic since uh, 2012 when I uh, joined IISC. Uh, and a lot of this work has been done primarily by these three grad students, Kiran Manoharan, uh, Sartha Gupta and uh, Anindya Datta. And uh, we have been very uh, privileged to have the have as collaborators uh, the following individuals. Uh, Jackie O'Connor from Penn State, Sean Bog and uh, Ahmed Ghunim from MIT, and of course, uh, Isaac Box from DLR. So the broad setting of today's talk is uh, thermoacoustic instability. And uh, there have been a couple of uh, talks in this, uh, on this topic. So it should be, so, um, it should be familiar that uh, thermoacoustic instability is essentially caused by coupling between uh, combustor acoustics and unsteady heat release. So if you have uh, uh, heat release oscillations uh, and, uh, that, that can drive uh, pressure oscillations, which can then drive velocity and fuel air ratio fluctuations, which then again feed back and drive heat release oscillations. And this can now form uh, a feedback loop, which can then result in amplification. And as you can see from this uh, fairly uh, well-known set of before and after pictures that uh, this is a significant uh, operability problem. So that's uh, a combustor uh, head that was uh, uh, before before the event, and this is uh, after a flashback induced uh, combustion instability induced flashback, and you can see that the the damage is significant. So if we ask why it happens, uh, it is easy to see. It is to get a broad overview. It is easy to do. It can be it's easy to do this from looking at the acoustic energy balance equation. So let's say you have a combustor that I've drawn here. It's a cartoon. Uh, you have a flame, and then now you have uh, an acoustic wave shown here by this blue curve, uh, which uh, maybe I get my pointer on. Uh, this blue curve, which, uh, which essentially represents a pressure oscillation of some sort. So if you now uh, write down a balance for the acoustic energy, which is essentially this quantity, P prime squared divided by this times uh, U prime U prime, where the prime essentially represents the acoustic fluctuations, uh, you get three terms on the right. Uh, the first term is, is the driving term, which is essentially uh, a coupling between heat release and pressure oscillations. Q prime times P prime, integrated over the combustor. And uh, the remaining two terms uh, are basically end losses. So if you have acoustic waves radiate out of the combustor at, at the outlet or at the inlet, depending on what your end boundary condition is, and uh, some amount of viscous dissipation, which can then uh, damp acoustic energy. So if you get acoustic energy growth, which is combustion instability, broadly when driving exceeds, uh, is able to overcome uh, your losses. And the driving itself is favorable only when this integral sort of, uh, if you average this now over a time period of oscillation, uh, that turns out to be zero. The Q prime and P prime uh, adjust so that uh, they are greater than zero. So that so this is the the uh, well-known Rayleigh criterion, which which says when you get combustion combustion instability. 
So there are multiple routes by which you can have fuel air ratio coupling, uh, by which you can have uh, heat release oscillations in a combustor. So if you now have, again, going back to this cartoon below, if you have an acoustic wave traveling in the system, uh, what you have here is an oscillatory pressure drop across this injector uh, section up here. So that can cause two things. It can cause the, the uh, mass flow rate to oscillate. It can cause the fuel flow rate to oscillate. And that can then give, you, give rise to an equals ratio fluctuation like this, which then interacts with the flame. And then the whole thing just becomes, um, uh, that gives you Q prime and then that sets up the possibility of thermoacoustic instability uh, given the coupling between Q prime and P prime. And uh, this particular mechanism has been studied uh, by uh, the Leuven group and some of, some of this work I was a part of. Uh, and these are uh, fair, the fairly, uh, the most, the, the most well-known papers that uh, from, our, from this group that uh, discuss this instability, uh, this mechanism. However, there's, there's other mechanisms possible. So if you have now acoustic uh, pressure oscillations, what that does is it induces acoustic velocity oscillations uh, all over the combustor. And typically at an injector opening like this, you, might, you would expect that this, this uh, region would be a velocity antinode. In other words, you'd get high amplitude well, acoustic velocity oscillations. Now that can put up shear layers in the in the shear layers, which can then roll up. Uh, and uh, this is this is as far as my artistry goes. Uh, this 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 is to represent a rolled up shear layer, and these vortices can then interact with the flame and uh, wrinkle it, causing burning area oscillations, and that gives rise to heat release oscillations. And this is something that. Uh, has been again studied by both the Ecole Centrale group and uh, R and the Lewin group in uh, the 2000s, some of which I was a part of. Um, and in this paper that uh, sh shown here, that we that was a collaboration between Matthew Juniper at Cambridge and myself. What we did was uh, we showed that the characteristics of this hydrodynamic oscillation can actually impact. Uh, especially, specifically, the phase speed of these oscillations can can impact the nature of the uh, the nature of combustor stability. So, for all these reasons, it's important to understand hydrodynamic uh, stability of uh, combustor flow feeds. So, now how do these? Uh, now, if we dig a little deeper, how do how do acoustic uh, oscillations and uh, hydrodynamic instabilities interact? So we can have this first scenario, which I which I call fully coupled forcing. You can have hydrodynamic modes which are receptive to acoustic forcing, which means when forced, the shear layer rolls up or some other feature uh, comes up in the flow, and uh, you get velocity flow velocity oscillations, and that interacts with the flame, giving you heat release oscillations. And assuming that uh, the heat release oscillations so produced is favorably disposed relative to the uh, pressure field, uh, acoustic pressure field, you can get uh, this sort of feedback loop going between the acoustic and the hydrodynamic modes, and as well as, uh, and the whole thing can then sustain heat release and the pressure oscillation. You can also have another possibility, and this is something that is not very common. Um, so this I call semi-open loop forcing. The hydrodynamic instability mode is self-excited. Okay, so it, it, it behaves like a flow oscillator. So even with or without acoustic forcing, you would have a, a coherent velocity oscillation. Uh, you could have a coherent velocity oscillation in the combustor, which can then just, which can couple with the flame and just drive heat release oscillations. And that, that just drives acoustic, uh, that just that that heat release oscillation itself just uh, just drives acoustic uh, perturbations, and then how serious or significant this is depends on how close or uh, far this the uh, dominant frequencies of this uh, self-excited hydrodynamic instability are from the combustor acoustic eigen uh, natural frequencies. Uh, but the reason I say this is semi-open loop is because you can still have the acoustic velocity oscillation. Uh, interacting with the flame and then giving you heat release oscillations. And so you can have a bit of a feedback loop, but the main event is the self-excited uh, hydrodynamic uh, oscillation, which can drive heat release oscillations in an open loop fashion. So we, 
so uh, we we have found evidence of both of these mechanisms operating in this uh, experiment uh, uh, which was performed by uh, in ahmed ghonim's group in the early uh, you know sort of between 20, 2009 and about 2012 and uh, the this is uh, a, the the configuration is that of a backward facing step combustor so air enters in here at the left there's a choke plate and there's a fairly long mixing section where fuel is uh, where the fuel that's injected here just downstream of the choke plate mixes and uh, then there is a contraction and a sudden expansion at this step that's the backward facing step and here you have the flame anchored and uh, we have from their experiments time resolved 1 kilohertz piv measurements and some pressure measurements at various points and uh, this is just a uh, schematic showing how the piv was done it was done in the mid section and you can get a sense for how the uh, this is to scale you can get a sense for the aspect ratio of the of the combustor so now if uh, so 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 the experiments were done by keeping uh, the effective air velocity at the step roughly constant 5.2 meters per second uh, the temperature was 300 kelvin they did do 500 kelvin but i'm just going to talk about these results and that that gives you a renolds number of about 6500 uh, uh, based on the step height and this uh, bulk flow velocity and viscosity at this temperature so the experiment was performed by varying from varying ex, varying equivalence ratio from lean blow out to about uh, to to one and they observed three different thermoacoustic states so this plot on the left uh, the first, this uh, plot on the left here uh, the color field shows uh, the amplitude of oscillation the vertical axis shows frequency and the uh, horizontal axis shows equivalence ratio and you can see that there are three different uh, states that uh, this combustor can that this combustor goes through uh, at about 0.6 or some 0.65 or some or thereabouts you get uh, a uh, you you get one instability one sort of weak sort of instability and then once you cross about 0.77 or point you are i think this is about 0.77 yeah and that gives you a very strong instability and then there is a mode shift that happens uh, later as you go further uh, this now this plot below here plots overall spl versus equivalence ratio and i'd like you to just focus on the blue curve here and you can see that this is now the first inst instability state and that is the high amplitude state so you see this and you see that even if you add hydrogen to the fuel you see that the general structure is preserved but uh, the instability transitions happen at uh, linear equivalence ratios so this is now uh, a line of sight uh, chemiluminescence uh, visualization of flame dynamics this is now the uh, the first state uh, if i can get this to play ah okay there we go So so this is the first state where there is no instability that's a quiescent state this is at a operating fee of 0.65 and you see that the flame is not doing much it's just flapping around and if you look at the pressure here uh, it's about 200 pascals and you see that it's not very coherent there is some intermittent coherence but not much okay now moving on if we go to the next state now this is at Uh, this is at phi equals 0.72 so we are talking about somewhere around the peak the peak instability around here and uh, here you see that the flame essentially uh, rolls up around vortices that are shed from the step but it it never sort of detaches from the step it always stays attached and you can see here that the amplitude has increased of the pressure oscillation and you have more periodic behavior Uh, and finally at the high, at point 85 you this is a point here at this in this high amplitude uh, state where we see that the flame essentially uh, why is this coming ah okay you see that the flame detaches goes back comes forward you know and it, it it generally does a very violent oscillation around the step and you can see that the pressure amplitude is high and the the oscillation is 
is fairly uh, coherent. So you see that the, there are these three states. Okay. So the dynamics of the flame is qualitatively and quantitatively different in each of the, in the two states which have unstable behavior, and that suggests that uh, there is a different there there are there's some difference in the mechanism that's generating heat release oscillations. Since this is perfectly premixed. Uh, the fuel air ratio coupled mechanism does not uh, play a role in this experiment. So now we'd like to understand this. So we, so this is now, uh, I'd, I'd like to give you a, a brief overview of how we do the analysis. So you start with the two dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, and then you say that, uh, let's say we have uh, disturbances of the form like this, a mode shape times e power i omega t, put that into the Navier-Stokes and that gives you this eigenvalue problem. And uh, you, we see that uh, Q naught is limited by this, uh, I mean, I, and you get this eigenvalue problem, which you then just solve. But the practical problem in this particular uh, study was that Q naught was limited by the streamwise extent of the PIV measurement. So we don't have Q naught everywhere. We took, we have, we were taking Q naught directly from the from the experiment, and and Q naught is essentially the base state, the base flow state, the time average flow state around which you linearize the Navier-Stokes equations. So we use, uh, we we have to resort to a method that was developed using uh, WKB exp uh, WKB expansions applied to uh, to this uh, equation, and this is a classic paper in uh, by uh, Jean-Marc Chomas in uh, studies in applied math 1991 so if you so the way this goes is the the solution for the uh, for the oscillation has this form you have a function q hat uh, which depends on the uh, which depends on the base flow at a given streamwise location times this uh, envelope where you have this function in here k naught which is a spatially varying wave number Minus omega g, which is then the uh, the oscillation free complex oscillation frequency of the hydrodynamic oscillation. Okay, so how do you get these? How do you get q hat, k naught, etc. to to be able to construct this solution? So let's say you have a spatially varying base flow like this, and I've and I've the cartoon here suggests a, a slowly evolving mixing layer, where the mixing layer uh, thickness evolves downstream d of x like this. So then if you do, uh, so then what, to, to get Q hat, what you do is you at, you go to every streamwise location and you do a local parallel flow analysis. So what you do is you take the velocity profile at, that, at a given streamwise location shown in green, and you construct a parallel flow, uh, a uniform parallel flow out of that. And then you ask, suppose I impulsively perturb this uniform parallel flow, what, is the solution that what is the solution for my impulse response and it is that solution which can be written like this that gives you q hat of y and uh, and from the uh, and and from what is known as the dispersion relation associate that links uh, the wave number of the wave number of the oscillation to the frequency of the oscillation you can determine what you can determine another uh, a local a local uh, impulse response frequency omega naught, which which satisfies this uh, this condition, d omega by dk equal to zero. Now this is a fairly well known result in the hydrodynamic stability literature, and uh, I I don't want to go too much into it, but uh, the consequences of this are as follows. So if you have so you can have two kinds of uh, local impulse response characteristics. So you can have a convectively unstable response. Which, which is what you get if the omega naught that you get from your, from your local parallel flow solution has a negative imaginary part. And what that means is if you impulsively perturb the flow here, you get this wave packet that sort of propagates off downstream like this. So in a sense, you, the flow at the location of perturbation stay, becomes sta it goes back to being uh, stable, but then you generate a packet of disturbance that grows as you go downstream. The other situation happens when uh, omega naught is greater than zero. So, th and, and then you get a stationary wave packet that spreads spatially in time. So, which means if you perturb here, you get this disturbance that sort of, the, the, whose uh, wave packet, uh, disturbance in the form of a wave packet, which, whose, whose width spreads as you, go, as you go forward in time. And it turns out that uh, the, 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 
you can now if you do this at every location, you now have omega naught as a function of x. Okay. Now the uh, at, corresponding to the streamwise velocity profile at each location, and it turns out from the mathematics of constructing the solution that this uh, omega g, in other words, the oscillation frequency associated with the global non-parallel flow uh, instability is given can be determined from the analytic continuation of uh, omega naught onto the complex plane using this uh, approach now it's not really important to know to remember all of this but essentially the it is important it is important to know that if if you have a, a large number of profiles that are uh, absolutely unstable in a given non parallel flow you can get self excited flow so we we applied this technique to the to the PIV measurements that were provided uh, to us by uh, Emma's group, and uh, for and what they had done was they 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 did an auxiliary experiment where they shortened the length of the combustor and uh, got rid of the combustion instability and that sort of uh, and so time averaging those measurements. It it sort of reveals the 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 base state from which the original instability develops in the in the in the nominal uh, long combustor experiments. So the total combustor length in the long experiments was five meters, and uh, the one that we took the base flow from was was one point five. And we're looking at those three states: 0 0.63, 0 0.72, and uh, 0.85. So we're doing stability analysis at each of these. And the details of all of this can be found in our in the in a paper that we published uh, some years ago. So for base flow density, we we just we just come up with uh, we track the flame front using the the uh, jump in uh, in uh, seeding uh, particle seeding density, and uh, that then gives you a bunch of instantaneous flame edges, and from which you can now uh, extract a mean flame location and a flame brush thickness based on the RMS of the flame position at each streamwise location. And then we presume a density profile like this, where R is essentially the ratio of burnt to unburnt gas uh, density determined using a, a, a chemical equilibrium calculation. So this is now uh, the result that we get from our local analysis. So now for the fee equals 0.63 case, which is stable, you see you get this red curve. Now what's plotted here on the x-axis is basically streamwise location. And on the y-axis is the is the imaginary part of omega. In other words, the imaginary part of the uh, oscillation frequency of the local impulse response. And you see here, you can get this very small pocket of omega naught i greater than zero. In other words, self-excited uh, absolute inst instability. And the rest of the flow is pretty much convectively unstable, omega naught i less than zero. However, for 0.72, you see that the flow is almost absolutely unstable everywhere. Okay, you have this wide, large pocket of absolute instability. And that then tells you that uh, for 0.85, you can expect that the flow would be self-excited. But for these two cases, 6.3, uh, for 0.72, sorry, the flow would be self-excited. And for 6.3 and 8.5, you would expect that the flow is not self-excited. And that is pretty much what we find. So this table here tabulates uh, omega g. Uh, this column is basically was put in to do some kind to do a bit of uncertainty analysis, and the last column lists the natural os hydrodynamic oscillation frequency of the shear layer, uh, the range based on our uncertainty uh, analysis uh, in terms of hertz. So you see here that you get uh, at 0.72, where we expected to have an unstable, uh, self unstable, self-excited shear layer. That's what our analysis gives us, and it. Uh, is fairly and the growth rate is fairly insensitive to the perturbation in the brush thickness that uh, we did and the frequency stays roughly constant at about 42 to 45 now this is very close to the combustor acoustic mode which is about 40 hertz okay so you see now in this case we have a self excited instability hydrodynamic instability that can interact with the flame whose instability frequency is close to the combustor acoustic mode. And uh, that's what uh, gives us uh, this peak, this, uh, this strong, insta this sort of strongish instability at 0.72. And you see, as you move off in uh, equals ratio in either direction, the amplitude decays. And that's simply because as you move off and you change the, and you change your equals ratio, you move the flame 
flame stabilization location, that will then change the natural frequency of the shear layer. And so you get non-resonant forcing on either side. So that's why you get this sort of peak behavior. And the peak happens because you're really close to the acoustic mode here. And interestingly, if you look at now the phase between the Q prime and the P prime, uh, and this was determined experimentally from chemical luminescence and acoustic uh, pressure measurement signals, uh, you see here that the phase is about pi by two. And what this means is that the Rayleigh criterion is not really favorable for this case. It's, it's on the edge of being favorable. So you have a fairly strong instability uh, without having, uh, without actually, uh, you know, without the acoustic, uh, the, the Rayleigh criterion itself being very, very, very favorable. So that's why this particular state, we believe, is, a, is an example of semi-open loop forcing where you have the self-excited instability just driving the, uh, off, this, off the shear layer, driving heat release oscillations. And, that, uh, and then that excites an acoustic response in this combustor. Now at 0.85, which is the high amplitude instability. Uh, what we find here is that uh, if you look at this table again below, you see that the, uh, the growth rate is the imaginary part of the of the instability growth rate, uh, instability frequency is uh, is sort of is very sensitive to is uh, is very sensitive to this param this uh, flame brush thickness that we put into our model and what this suggests is that uh, this uh, shear layer is not self excited okay there are other reasons that we that we talk about to 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 say why this uh, shear layer is not self excited and uh, that has to do with certain certain um, over predictions that are associated with the wkb analysis and so then you've got now um, uh, so and 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 that is again described in the paper but uh, what you can then do is you can now construct what is known as an adjoint mode by solving an, an adjoint eigenvalue problem for this particular mode. And what that does for you is reveal to you where this flow is receptive to forcing. So this is uh, the adjoint mode for uh, one of the components of the adjoint mode. Uh, the, the, this uh, magenta line represents schematically the step. And you see just downstream of the step, uh, you have uh, uh, just downstream of the step, you have this very large region of uh, receptivity. So, so if you think about the acoustics of this duct, this is where in, it is in this region you would have a velocity antinode. So the so the acoustic mode is able to force the combustor exactly where the shear layer is is receptive and generate a very large uh, shear layer roll up response, which then uh, results in uh, uh, combustion instability. And again, uh, this is the phase between Q prime and P prime, and you see that this uh, phase is much lower uh, in this uh, in this uh, high amplitude state, and that is now favorable uh, from the standpoint of uh, Rayleigh criterion. And so you see that you now have the fully coupled mechanism, where you have a receptive mode being driven by acoustics, which then drives heat release, which then drives acoustics, and that that completes a feedback loop. And this is probably what and this is probably the, the mechanism that is most prevalent in uh, in practical combustors. Uh, the self, the, the semi-open loop can exist, but then uh, I, I, people have not necessarily been looking for it. So I, I don't think there is much reporting of this uh, in the literature, but the semi-open loop can happen. And this is uh, an example of that. Now, how can you mitigate the instability? So this is something that they tried to do uh, before before I got I entered the picture, and uh, this is a, this is a paper that uh, they pub the Gonim's group published in uh, 2010 uh, on the same same rig. And what they had was at the step they put microjets, steady microjets. Okay, so the, there's no these are not pulsed. So the uh, this two they looked at two strategies one. No, injecting normal to the flow and another injecting axially as shown uh, this way. Now, if you see the axial injection would, would sort of interfere, would hit the flow exactly where it was receptive and it would change the receptivity characteristics of the flow. So you, whereas a normal microjet would completely miss this uh, spot of receptivity. And so you would expect that uh, this may not, the normal microjet was not, is not going to be very effective at mitigating. 
And that's exactly what they see. So this is now overall sound pressure level versus equivalence ratio from this paper. And you see normal injection, uh, the, the dark uh, black line is the baseline without microjets. And uh, this is microjets at two flow rates. And you see that uh, there's really no impact. The instability doesn't uh, go away. However, when you inject axially, you see that uh, again, this is the, the circle, this dark black line is the nominal and but when you inject a little bit of flow, less than 10, less than a 10th of the main flow, you see that you get a fairly large suppression. And that's simply because you're hit, they, they were hitting the flow in the region of receptivity that sort of killed the shear layer response. So this is uh, uh, a summary of uh, that piece of work with on the backward facing step where we can now get, uh, where, where we've, we've sort of shown that you can get to instability by two processes, semi-open loop forcing by self-excited modes or by coupling, acoustic hydrodynamic coupling that then generates heat release oscillations. Uh, and the interesting thing is if you, you can identify regions of stability in the combustor by just doing an adjoint analysis. And this, this extends to a combustor of any complexity, it can be done. Uh, and that is something that can that is useful for uh, industrial design, which can then drive, uh, in, give insight for designers in designing, in sort of getting rid of the combustion instability itself. So next, we move on to, uh, I'd like to move on to discuss our work on swirl stabilized flames, uh, because that is the more technologically relevant uh, flow situation. So in a swirl, when you have a swirling, uh, when you introduce swirl in a in a flow uh, in a in a jet in a jet, you get you get this phenomenon known as vortex breakdown. So what that the con consequence of vortex breakdown is that uh, if you look at this cartoon here, where you have flow coming out of this nozzle, uh, you get this recirculation zone in the flow, which is referred to as the vortex breakdown bubble. And uh, if you have a center body in addition in your nozzle, and most uh, practical nozzles do have center bodies of one, 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 one form or the other for various reasons, you will get, uh, you, you can get these uh, wake recirculation zones stabilized behind the center body. Uh, and then you have shear layers between uh, this jet flow that goes around the break, vortex breakdown bubble. And, uh, and these shear layers can be fairly receptive to acoustic forcing. And there are several coherent instability modes that are known to, known to exist for these flows. And, uh, and uh, some of which can be, so most of which are uh, not self-excited, uh, but, but this flow is particularly receptive to acoustic forcing. However, there is one prominent self-excited instability known as the precessing vortex core, which is uh, commonly seen in and at gas turbine combustor conditions. And what the precessing vortex core is a helical is a, is a helical instability that occurs at, at uh, large swirl intensity. And by large, I mean about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 or greater, uh, where S is now the uh, swirl, swirl number or swirl intensity defined as the actual flux of tangential momentum divided by the actual flux of actual momentum coming out of the nozzle. And the reason you get this processing vortex core is because if you see this, uh, this image here, uh, this movie here, which essentially shows you the out of plane vorticity component uh, from, a, from a swirling jet. So the flow is from bottom to top. You have a jet, a swirl jet that goes from bottom to top. And because of uh, the high swirl, which is about 0.95 here, you see that you, the breakdown bubble in the center has started to process. So this the sort of left-right lateral movement in a plane is essentially a, uh, because you have this precession about the axis. And then you see that you get this, uh, this shear layer roll up into a helical vortex, which is what many people identify with this instability. But uh, I will show you some results which tell you that the, the actual driver is this precession. And uh, this instability has been shown to impact fuel air premixing, and so you can favorably impact NOx and CO. But most importantly, despite all this action that this the PVC induces in the flow, it does not cause global heat release oscillations. And uh, that has to do with the fact that uh, if you have an axisymmetric flame in the flow, the way the PVC wrinkles the flame sort of generates a, a, a 
an increase in area in one place is balanced by a decrease in area at another place on the flame so that the net effect is to have no heat release oscillation. And uh, this was uh, shown theoretically by uh, the Leuven group and uh, where, and there was a, I mean, it was called out experimentally in this paper in 2012, but some of Isaac's uh, earlier data from the Prekinsta also shows uh, similar, shows that the PVC does not excite uh, heat release uh, oscillation. So uh, why is it important? Why are we interested if it doesn't do heat release oscillation? So this is uh, a more recent study from uh, Kunim's group. Again, in the experiment was performed the same way as in the uh, backward facing step combustor study, but now with a swirl combustor. So again, you have methane hydrogen uh, injected, premixed and injected into the combustor. And uh, the equivalence ratio is again varied as the, um, as the control parameter. And you see that you get now uh, at about 0.6, uh, at, at about 0.6, uh, 2.65, you get this uh, high uh, amplitude instability in the combustor. Okay. And they found, they and by doing a lot of imaging, et cetera, they verified that this was because of two things. One, there was a PVC in the, there was a PVC in the flow field. So all these, these, these now show snapshots at various, uh, just chemical luminescence, line of sight averaged uh, snapshots at, uh, at three, uh, actually luminosity snapshots at three different, uh, at several different equals ratios around this transition. And uh, each of these cases has a PVC in it. The PVC doesn't go away. It's there despite the flame. And then you see that as you go from 0.58 to 6.2, you see that the flame has now closed on itself. Here it's stabilized only in the inner shear layer, but now it's sort of, stabilized on the outer shear layer. So you have this envelope flame-like structure and this envelope flame-like structure is now, uh, now results in combustion instability. So even though the PVC by itself doesn't generate heat release oscillations, it can induce, it can induce uh, um, um, flame shape changes and have other impacts that can then lead to combustion instability. So we need to, so we decided to, uh, to study this. Uh, another thing we found was, uh, this is now a, a variable jet experiment and the jet experiment I will describe in a second. Uh, so this is a swirl, this is a, this is a 59,000 swirl jet, uh, which is acoustically forced axially. Uh, and in all these figures, the flow is from bottom to top. The uh, spectrum here basically shows a pressure spectrum. What's plotted here is uh, on the X axis, I'm sorry that this figure is hiding it. It's essentially plotting the, uh, uh, the pressure amplitude uh, measured at a microphone just downstream of the jet uh, nozzle exit. Uh, X-axis is frequency, and this spike here represents the acoustic forcing. Okay. Now this angle here represents. The, now in this particular rig, what we could do was increase the rig, increase the swirl number by varying the angle of the blades that uh, were associated with the swirler. This is Jackie O'Connor's rig at Penn State. And uh, the, the larger the angle, the higher the swirl number. Okay? And this peak that you see here is associated with a PVC that happens as you increase swirl number going from 40 to 65. But the interesting thing is, if you now look at the acoustic oscillation, the flow response at the acoustic forcing frequency, at 40 degrees, you see that there is this nice coherent roll up in the flow. This is the flow response at this forcing frequency. But at 65 degrees, where you have the strong PVC, the flow response goes away. So the PVC can actually help you suppress the receptivity of the shear layer. And so that it could act as a means to control a combustion instability as well. So we decided to look at, uh, understand the PVC a little better. And uh, the, uh, the main results are all described in this JFM paper. And this is the rig. You have uh, flow coming in from the bottom, uh, a swirler that, where the blade angles can be varied. Uh, coming out, and uh, this is the PIV. This is the region in which uh, the uh, PIV measurements were made at uh, five kilohertz, time resolved, stereoscopic, and uh, there were also pressure measurements done close to the dump plane. And the control parameter that we varied was the swirl number going all the way from zero to about 1.8 at a fixed mass flow rate of uh, at a fixed air mass flow rate, which gives us a velocity here of over 36 meters per second. So as you increase swirl, this sequence of uh, figures on the top essentially shows you the mean axial velocity field. 
and you see here that uh, as you increase swirl you get you start to get uh, the you start to get the breakdown bubble this uh, zero velocity contour essentially is the uh, contour of uy equal to 0 the correspondingly this uh, set of figures shows spectral pod modes at the oscillation frequency of the pvc and you see that there is a strong central this is uh, this is now transverse velocity and you see that the, there is a strong left right oscillation along the center line which shows that this bubble is actually precessing at these swirl numbers now if you extract uh, if you extract the time series at at a, at a point here one just downstream of the nozzle exit plane as uh, shown here and plot the amplitude versus uh, amplitude at the peak frequency in uh, from the fourier transform of the data versus uh, the uh, and and also the frequency of the frequency of the peak of the peak of the peak of the amplitude peak uh, as a function of swirl number you see that the pvc frequency varies linearly and you see that its amplitude squared varies also varies linearly so essentially this shows that you're getting a at some critical swirl in the flow you're getting a hopf bifurcation that that then suggests that the pvc is a stable limit cycle oscillation and uh, several questions that we'd like we we addressed in that study was is it a, a can we show that it is a limit cycle oscillation what causes it is it the breakdown or is, is the pvc causing the breakdown because it's not very clear from the experiment and uh, and is if i if i were to take a mean flow at at a case at a point where i did have uh, uh, a PVC s greater than s c would I then get um, uh, would I would I then be able to do stability analysis and predict the PVC uh, characteristics and then why does it suppress response so I'll show you some results that come from that so uh, so so very quickly what we did was a weekly nonlinear analysis that we have uh, that on around the critical swirl that we identified from the experiments. And the entire analysis, which is fairly involved and, and it's described in this paper, uh, uses the base flow state at the critical swirl that was determined from the experiment. So this is now the time average flow state, uh, uz, u theta, and ur that we got from the experiment. Uh, and what we, are essentially, what we essentially did was to, was to determine what the oscillation amplitude was to order epsilon square in this uh, in this asymptotic expansion parameter so in, in other words to the include the effect of leading order nonlinearity and you get a solution that has this structure so the first term is just the the base time average flow at the critical the, the second term is the modification that you get in the base flow simply because you increase swirl then there is a distortion term that comes because you get a pvc in the flow uh, and that's that changes the flow time average flow and then you have the pvc itself and its harmonic so if you now look at the 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 solution for the base flow modification you see uh, that is given by an equation that looks like this so there is some operator here that times q q delta which is the base flow modification and then you have this whole right hand side terms important thing to note is there is no it is all q naught in other words it this modification depends only on the time average flow, flow state at Q0, not on the hydrodynamic mode. So essentially, you see that the breakdown, and, and if you look at now what the uh, axial velocity component of this modification is, you see you get this very strong bubble-like structure downstream uh, of the jet. Again, flow is from bottom to top. In all figures, flows from bottom to top. Okay? So you see that the onset of breakdown is independent of the PVC. The PVC is not really causing it. Rather, it is the other way. The breakdown is what is causing the PVC. Uh, then if you ask for limit cycle characteristics, there is a marginally unstable mode at, uh, at, the, uh, at critical swirl. And you see it has the same structure as the spot mode where you have strong center line oscillations. This is just beyond criticality. You see you have strong center line oscillations and then our linear stability analysis shows that there's a hydrodynamic mode that has the same structure. So that's why the PVC is essentially driven, is essentially a, a bubble precession instability, not a helical shear layer roll up. 
And because you see that this mode has almost no oscillations in the shear layer, the helical shear, the shear layer oscillation that you see are because of the bubble precession that, that is induced by this mode, which then perturbs the shear layers and causes them to roll up in a helical fashion. Then uh, is it, so then the next question is, is this, is, this a, is this a stable limit cycle? And that tells you whether the bifurcation is what we think it is. And that can be determined by asking what, uh, by first writing down what the amplitude of the PVC, uh, an equation for the amplitude of the PVC, which looks like this. So there's a linear growth term, a nonlinear saturation term. And if both of these are, these constants are positive, then we have a stable, uh, the PVC is a, is a stable limit cycle. And then, so we determine, we, so we determine these constants from our, uh, from the base flow and our nonlinear analysis, and you, when we verify that indeed these qu these quantities do have uh, for this particular swirling jet experiment have have real uh, have positive real parts, which then confirms that the PVC is a limit cycle. And this here is a plot of uh, what the nonlinear analysis gives for the frequency of the PVC and the symbols of the experiment. And there are some differences because of turbulence modeling uncertainties, which we discussed in the paper. And uh, the recent paper by Chris Douglas in the physics of fluids also touches on this point. Uh, then the question of mean flow. Can, uh, now that we know, can we now take a time average flow and uh, run it through stability analysis and get a PVC prediction? So we did this, we first tried this using LES because we get access to base flow field everywhere. And we did this on the triple nozzle rig that was set up at Georgia Tech by uh, Tim Leuven. That has a flow coming in here, an axial swirler coming out and there's this big rectangular box. And they've written several papers on it looking at uh, how this flow, this particular rig responds to transverse forcing, et cetera. But what we did was we took the time average flow from an LES of this rig, applied linear stability, and then compared what we get from the full nonlinear LES and the stability. So these are the, these are two uh, modes. This is now a, a spectral POD mode corresponding to the PVC oscillation that we get from our LES. And this is what we get from doing linear stability on the mean flow. And you see that if you, if you look at these two figures, you see that the mode shape is fairly well predicted from the mean flow. And uh, then again, you see that the frequencies, and you see again here, the linear stability predicts a frequency that is fairly close to what the LES predicts, okay? Now, the reason we did this was to understand, again, this, this, this study itself was motivated by a reason to, to understand control, how the PVC may be controlled. And that uh, uh, can be understood, and that is essentially motivated by this result from the earlier Manoharan study. So he, the figure here essentially now shows the regions of the flow that contribute to this linear growth of the PVC. So this is a map. So each of these, so the BA is, is a sum of contributions from all these points in the flow field. And you see here that uh, there's a large contribution from the region just upstream of the breakdown bubble. And uh, so if you, if you were to interfere with the flow here uh, by, do, by doing something to the flow here, you, can, you should be able to control the PVC. Um, and that can be done by introducing a center body. So if you now have a center body, the wake hits the, the wake that you create in the flow, disrupts the flow exactly where the PVC, uh, the PVC hydrodynamic mode is sensitive to changes in the flow. Um, and uh, you can now have two situations. You can have a wake that is now separate from the breakdown bubble, or you can just have one combined, you know, wake and bubble structure. So we decided to, so then we, we, we did an experimental study with uh, Gonim's group to see whether, to see which of these would be effective in controlling uh, the PVC. So this is uh, again, their combustor, this we did in non-reacting flow. Uh, we, 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 we did uh, experiments at two swirl numbers, 0.67 and 1.17. And what this change in swirl number does is it moves the, it moves the breakdown bubble towards this center body. So in this case, we get a wake and center body like structure. And in the 1.17 case, we get one which is completely merged. And the details are again in this paper. And uh, this is, these are the conditions at which this experiment was done. 
uh, and then what we found was we get uh, uh, we we get intermittent oscillations, and uh, we we had to develop a new a, a new data analysis technique that essentially shows. Uh, uh, that essentially shows what the uh, that essentially allows us to recover in a spectrally band limited way what these uh, what the oscillation looks like. So I'm I'm now going to skip through the the description of this uh, uh, in the interest of time and go straight to this result. And what we show here is essentially this this plot here. I'd like you to just focus on the black black dots. The black dots essentially show plot the the energy of the oscillation as a function of mode number and you see that the most energetic mode in this flow is has a pvc structure this is now uh, again the transverse oscillation in this case the flow combustor was horizontal so flow is from left to right and you see that there is a strong center line transverse oscillation which shows that there is a pvc um, and then uh, if we ask what does the center body what effect does the center body have now, what is plotted in this graph is essentially uh, a, reg a region that shows where the amplitude of the, so the PVC is, is comprised of two, two modes. And what this plots is essentially the, the region where the instantaneous amplitudes of these two modes lie in, in a phase space spanned by these uh, A1 and A2, which are basically the instantaneous amplitude of these two modes. That's what these contours show. So for the most part in our time record, the amplitude of the PVC oscillation of the of the coherent the intermittent coherent oscillation uh, lies within these uh, lies within these contours, and so you can see that the center bodies uh, and you can see that as you increase the size of the center body, which means you're now increasing the size of the recirculation zone behind the center body, you suppress the PVC oscillation. So this now gives you a way to actually do passive control to control the PVC. So this uh, this is some new work that we've done where we looked at how PVC and nonlinear uh, dynamics can couple. But I'd like to skip this in the interest of uh, this uh, what is effectively my last slide, which is how does how does a flame influence the PVC? Now this, in my opinion, is still an open question. We don't know. We don't know very clearly yet. So there's been two, two, uh, two of us that looked at this using local stability techniques. And we showed that if you have a flame in a shear layer, that suppresses absolute instability. And we roughly reached the conclusion at the same time. Uh, but then you have experiments like Gonin's experiment that show a, a, a flame in a shear layer across a range of equivalence ratios that shows a PVC always. So there must be some other reason for suppression. And uh, that is suggested by this recent study, which we did in the context of Tekinsta uh, uh, using DLR uh, measurements. And uh, what, what is shown here are mean axial velocity fields and OH plif, uh, mean OH plif fields for this uh, burner in two states. I, I, this is now all at a mean uh, operating equivalence ratio of about uh, 0.65. And these purple square, and, and what you see here is you have this nice, from these axial velocity plots, you have this nice bubble type vortex breakdown. And in this, in this, in this set of figures where the flow is premixed, uh, where, the, where the reactants are perfectly premixed, you have this, this flame that is lifted off the center body. And this and the non reacting flow both, which look very similar, have a PVC. Okay. So when you don't have a flame, there is some flame out here, but when it's off the center body here in this region where you expect the wave maker to lie, you get a PVC. But when you do technically premix, when you do technical premixing, the flame tends to attach and that suppresses the PVC. And the reason this is hashed is because the PVC in this case is intermittent and we discussed that in this paper. Now, if you add hydrogen to, to, to sort of firmly anchor the flame to the center body, the PVC vanishes. Okay, so essentially what this suggests is it, it may not be the fact that you're suppressing the absolute instability of the shear layers, but it's more because you're disrupting the PVC uh, at the center line. And that is essentially a summary of the talk. Uh, we can do, we have two modes by which you can have uh, heat release response in combustors. 
and uh, mitigation can be guided by receptivity analysis and the joint stability analysis using mean flow data that is reasonable to do for uh, practical gas turbine combustors high reynolds number with swirl and uh, we we can control the pvc with uh, center bodies and uh, and uh, the effective effectiveness of the center bar effectiveness of the control depends on how how well the pvc uh, the the breakdown sorry the vortex breakdown bubble and the center body wake overlap um thank you thanks for listening and uh, i guess i'm way over time but if there's time for questions i'd be happy to address them. okay thanks santosh a really interesting talk we do have a number of uh, questions from the audience so i'll just go through them one at a time and um, see how many we can get through so the first is from jay gore it's uh, several questions in fact together and one first is how important are the atomization properties of the fuel sprays in the uh, early part of the talk that you're talking about and what level of pre-vaporization and pre-mixing matter and so yeah so uh, generally uh, if you have um, if you have fuel spray it it is known that when you have acoustic forcing these they can cause uh, droplet clustering uh, and uh, other uh, and other and other and other effects and what this does is then give give you a uh, spatially varying equals ratio oscillation uh, that can then promote an instability so yes the, the fuel spray atomization is uh, is an important player in uh, practical combustors and uh, though sound propagation through the spray itself i don't think through the liquid itself is i don't think uh, important at least for gt uh, instability what what is more important is how the acoustic oscillation imp impacts atomization and whether and what fuel ratio in homogeneity that gives rise to so that is the that is key Okay, great. And a follow-on question to that was, how do the gas phase acoustic waves couple with the liquid phase? And is there sound propagation in the liquid phase, like communications between marine life? Also from Jay Gore. Um, yeah. Well, it, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the connection to marine life. I really, I really can't comment on that. Uh, but like like i said it's it, the acoustic propagation uh, in the liquid phase is not i, I don't think is the key is the key uh, i mean it 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 may be important from the standpoint of exciting the instabilities that that might promote or uh, suppress the atomization process itself but the key the key the way to think about this is how the acoustics affects the atomization process uh, okay, yeah. great. Uh, next question is actually one of my own. On uh, page 25, we see that the flame stabilizes in the outer shear layer for some of the cases. Now, is that an effect of the PVC, i.e. The, the fluid dynamics, the hydrodynamics of the flame? Or could it be a result of the increased wall temperature arising from the uh, higher equivalence ratio of the flame? And I asked this specifically because in last week's webinar, we uh, heard some interesting uh, research from um, Nicholas mm -hmm. Noray about the effect of um, temperature sweeps and burner temperature on um, mm -hmm. flame stabilization location. So I'm yeah. interested to see how that might affect things. Yeah, so in this case at 0.62, uh, so they did, uh, this was verified to be because of uh, flame propagation down in a helical path. So they oh. did this by mounting two cameras that were 90 degrees uh, at, two, at, at two positions that were 90 degrees apart. So you could see when a feature came in in the first camera and disappeared there, it appeared in the second one. So it was very easy to see that there, there is a helical, the flame does propagate down in the helical path and it's primarily PVC driven. There are other things, they could, they could, also, they could also come up with a, a way to divide their stable and unstable states based on the spinning frequency of the PVC. It, it nicely separates the, the data between stable and unstable. Uh, across various fuels and things. So it's a very interesting paper, this this one in, in 2016. And uh, uh, on the basis of that, it's all PVC driven in this particular case, not necessarily flame wall interaction. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. The next question is from Yang Queen Lee to everyone. How many thanks, Professor Santosh. Is there any effective 
methods to measure the flow velocity distribution across the cross sections. I'm not sure which experiment it was referring to in this. Um, across the cross sections. Uh, I assume the cross sections assume, of the combustor, perhaps. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, in, you mean in the transverse plane, not in the RZ plane, but in the R theta plane. I uh, well, I mean, I think this is more a question for experimentalists and. Uh, I think I think I think maybe the session chair could answer it, but uh, <laughs> I yes, could answer you, it you, myself. I wanted to pass yes, it to you. you. You could, yeah. Uh, at the risk of at the risk of uh, you know uh, exposing my lack of expertise in this area, I think it, it can be done very effectively using uh, stereo PIV techniques. And uh, but the details are are involved, and uh, I'm really not the expert on this. Isaac is in. Maybe yeah, I, I would offer an opinion on that and suggest that it could be possible to get um, effective planar measurements in the crossed plane by reorienting your PIV laser imaging region, perhaps. But yeah, um, yeah if if we're interested to, to cover that in more detail, then I'd suggest the uh, um, audience uh, send an email either to the Professor Anjamd or, or myself, and we could we could discuss it offline from here. Yeah, sure. Okay, next question is again from Jay Gore. Uh, when will we find out the answer to the question, how does a flame influence the PVC? It's a big question. Well, hopefully, see how we hopefully, ho hopefully in a couple of years, once once we have the ongoing LES study on the Prekinster done, uh, we, we will. But uh, as of now, in my mind, I don't think the answer is quite there yet. Uh, sort of the chicken and the egg problem. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, the next question is from Aditya Saurabh. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, uh, yes. Does the SPOD and the wavelet POD give different results in terms of the dominant mode structure during the intermittent oscillations? And if yes, why? So uh, it's quite remarkable how actually the answer is no. The SPOD and the WPOD uh, applied to both the, the MIT combustor and the DLR uh, combustor uh, both gave very close match for PVC in uh, between the modes that you see. So that's why, we, so that's one of the one of the criteria we give in our paper for saying that the intermittent oscillation, the globally intermittent oscillation that we are seeing when we have a center body is essentially a PVC that has been controlled uh, because of the similarity of those modes. But yeah. Yeah, great talk. So I have one question, right? I'd like to share your thoughts. If you're looking at the instability itself, it's so complicated. It depends on boundary condition and then the physical and chemical process. But if you look at that, the driving source about the instability is only P prime and Q prime, right? So the P prime and Q prime, and uh, mainly in combustion, you're coming from two things. One is the flow motion. You can clock in at the surface area, flame surface area increase and decrease, and fluctuating at the, uh, the, the flame surface area. The other reason that the, the P prime, Q prime, coming from really from chemistry or autoignition is so. If you have a flame autoignited back and forth, you're driving pressure fluctuation, and also you're driving heat release rate. So in order to physically to suppress instability, we have to suppress two modes. One is that uh, they due to flame surface air increase driving by the fluid mechanics instability. The other one is really that the combustion instability itself driving by auto ignition acceleration. And uh, so I wonder that anybody to looking at this kind of time scales, right? Uh, you yeah, looking at the surface uh, growth and then ignition time scales, so see whether they match or don't match. And how does that occur into the correlation? Yeah, it might be a new angle. Okay. To think about. So okay. there is. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's a very that's a very nice point that you made. Uh, so there have been people who have looked at this. Um, in fact, the first uh, ever pa paper that looked at uh, pressure wave, a pressure wave interacting with the flame. Uh, essentially did exactly what, what, what you suggested, how the pressure wave modulates the chemistry in the reaction zone. So this is uh, by a person, by Andy McIntosh uh, in 1991. There's a, a couple of papers in combustion flame. And this was the, this was the thing. But you can imagine that um, uh, if you had, 
if, if the pressure wave had to interact significantly with the flame, then either the time scale of the pressure wave and the chemical time scale would have to match or the length scale would have to match. Yeah. Either case, you're looking at very, very high frequency instabilities, which, have, uh, which in the context of GT, even, even in the context of screech, et cetera, have not been, uh, I mean, the frequencies are not that high. We're still talking of just frequencies in the kilohertz. Yeah. Whereas flame time scales are more like 10 to the 4 hertz, uh, getting getting into that. But there has been some study that, uh, there has been a study that Sri Krishna and uh, Tim Leuven did uh, about 2009, 2010, just after I graduated, where they, where they came up with a regime map where they talk about when one might be uh, more relevant than the, uh, essentially what you suggested, looking at time scales and things. So if right. the one place where auto ignition driven phenomena may be important is in reheat combustors so if you have like um, like if you have sequential combustion you have a, in a stationary gas turbine you have one main combustor a turbine stage and then a second combustor and where you have two uh, where you have flames and one auto ignition zone uh, that is stabilized downstream of a step uh, in that combustor auto ignition phenomena can become important and there was a recent, uh, there was a paper this year in Turbo Expo, uh, I believe Jonas Moek from Jonas Moek's group in uh, uh, NTNU that has looked at it. And again, it's a question of, again, uh, for a specific case, you'd have to actually do work out, do the, do the computation, like, you know, figure out auto ignition times and, or, or do a force calculation and see how significant it was. But certainly what you're saying can happen. There's no yeah. question. All right, so we, I, quite, the reason I ask it because I mean, when I do this, if you look at the flame propagation, right, in a, in a Kaizen mixture, and the flame is very well defined, and the plant of flame just propagated with, if you don't have instability. But if you have a, a meso scale channel, for example, you got this kind of a preheating or some kind of coupling, just like you have a swirling, you have preheating or you mix layer, mm -hmm. then you see the start of the flame start to oscillate. This is at the, uh, not at the uh, preheater level, but in a swarming itself, it is a preheating or ignition process. And uh, that depends on how do you couple them or decouple them. So anyway, so I just throw out my thought and share with the community. Yeah, no, and, uh, yeah. thank you. That, it, 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 it's a very valid point that you're making. Yeah. I, I agree. Right. I like your talk a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much. I would say we would close the seminar now. If um, people would like to turn on their cameras and um, thank the speaker, we can uh, we can do so. And.